Mahalo. It's a great pleasure to be here with all of you tonight, this afternoon. And uh, if you have questions about Kuanui, I hope you'll ask uh, Kehau and uh, Heloha Mele, who know more than I do about the land, who spend much more time on the land. But you can see where they're working. The Pu that's the part of this to the left up there is uh, Pu Kahena, which is right above our uh, wettest mala, our wettest agricultural field there, where we're trying to restore productivity to that land. Um, and I'll talk about what that means for, what I, I think it meant for Hawaiian society in the time before European contact. You know, and I think it's a really fundamental and very interesting and very important thing that uh, is right under our feet and it's really important to understand what's been going on with that and what it means to Hawaiian society. So I'm going to uh, talk about sustaining land and societies in pre-contact Hawaii. And I'm going to be using a model system perspective. By a model system, I don't mean, a, it's not a fancy way of saying the word example. It means that uh, you know, biologists like me use model systems all the time, which are systems that exemplify some aspect of the functioning of real systems, but are simpler in some way. And so you can understand what's going on with them in a much clearer and stronger way than you can by studying complex, the complexity of the real world. And so I will take that perspective here. Islands, I think, are simple relative to continents and in multiple dimensions and for multiple ways of understanding how the world works. That's true for things like evolution and the origin of species, which has been understood at least since Darwin, who visited the Galapagos and wrote, here I felt near both in space and time to that great fact, that mystery of mysteries, the first appearance of new beings on the earth. And he felt near because he was near, because he could see that the organisms in Galapagos were like those in South America, but different. And those on different islands in the Galapagos were different from each other. And so the great question of 19th century, early 19th century science was, how do new species arise? <laughs> was close to being answered there in a way that was not really possible in the more complex continental setting. Now, it's unfortunate Darwin never made it to Hawaii because Hawaii is much more interesting than Galapagos. <laughs> in that. Um, I say, say that as someone who's been to Galapagos three times. And if you've been to Galapagos, you know that when you're looking at uh, the group called Darwin's Finches, telling a large, medium ground finch from a small, large ground finch is a really difficult challenge. <laughs> it's not like telling an eevee from an apapani, which is a much simpler phenomenon. They're much more different from each other here, and it is much more comprehensible here. And I think it's true that islands are good models for understanding how ecosystems, combination of plants, animals, and soil develop, and uh, how they are differentiated over time, and also for understanding how cultures interact with land. In, I, I will show examples of each of these last two here. I spent a lot of time working on ecosystems in Hawaii over the years. Um, trying to understand what supplies the nutrients that keep plants productive and soils fertile in the very long term. As you go from wet to dry, and as you go from some of the youngest soils in the world to some of the oldest soils, which are, are occur on Kauai. And so in that process, I've... Um, seen that in young soils or very dry soils, plants get all the nutrients they need, except for nitrogen, from the breakdown of basaltic rock that supplies the nutrients that plants need to grow. Where it's wet, where it's greater than about uh, 2,500 millimeters or 100 inches of rain a year, um, <coughs> 
then most of the elements that have come from rock have been washed out by the time you get to a few tens of thousands of years old. And the soils are infertile and dependent on the atmosphere and ultimately the ocean to supply their nutrients. Um, that's true for most nutrients except for phosphorus. Phosphorus is um, not like the others because it's not really abundant in the surface ocean. It's also not really mobile in soils. And so if you want to understand what keeps phosphorus going, you've got to look to much older islands in the archipelago. Um, phosphorus for basalt from basalt from the rock underlying Hawaii lasts longer, sometimes a few million years old. But by about one and a half million years, most of the phosphorus that keeps plants going has been lost. And after that, it's only the trickle of dust that blows in from the Taklamakan Desert in western China that keeps the forest going on our soils. You can see that uh, dust from the Taklamakan Desert, if you look in the soils on Kohala, if you dig in Kohala, you'll see a layer of soil that's gray uh, right under the surface. If you look at that closely in the sunlight, you'll see that it sparkles. And that sparkling is mica that blew in the dust from Central Asia. Nothing will sparkle in Hawaiian uh, uh, soils of that age because the olivine that will sparkle disappears really quickly in only a few hundred years. And so there's no olivine in the soils of Kohala, but there is that mica that blows in from Central Asia. And you can see that this is dust from Central Asia that's blown in. It can meet your eye. It's something you can also track chemically very straightforwardly. And so that's one of the ways I think Hawaii is a good model. If we think about rainforests that occupy ancient soils with high rainfall in the world, the Amazon basin is the first thing that comes to mind. The Amazon basin is the great repository on earth of ancient soils and high rainfall. What keeps it going is that the dust that blows off of the Sahara Desert across the Atlantic and is deposited on the Amazon. Without that dust, the Amazon would be really unproductive. You know, Hawaii gets less dust from the Taklamakan Desert than the Amazon gets from the Sahara Desert. And so this, I think this illustrates why Hawaii is a good model for understanding the world, because you can't say that because it happens in Hawaii, it's also important in the Amazon. You can say that we can understand the process by which it happens in Hawaii because Hawaii is so distinct from Central Asia that we can trace the dust to Hawaii. And knowing that, knowing how important that is, we can then test, do the same kind of test in the Amazon and say, how important is the Sahara in providing mineral nutrients that keep the soils somewhat fertile and the forest somewhat productive compared to uh, what they would be in the absence of that dust. And uh, we find out that, uh, in fact, the dust coming from the Sahara is crucial to the functioning of Amazonian forests. And the fact that uh, all of the ancient rainforests of Earth are dependent on their connections through the atmosphere to arid areas that are hundreds and sometimes thousands of kilometers away upwind. And uh, sometimes the connection occurred deep in the past, which I think is the case in the Taklamakan in Hawaii. The ice age was much windier than the present is, and there was more dust probably blowing into Hawaii from the Taklamakan in the... Uh, ice ages than, it, than it occurs at present. And so the last full glacial ended about 18,000 years ago. Most of the dust that keeps our soils going came in then. Another way that I think
Hawaii is really useful. And this is much more directly relevant to what we see at Puanui and in dryland forests more generally, is that uh, there are very distinct thresholds in the characteristics of soils that emerge along continuous gradients in rainfall or continuous gradients in soil age. And the converse of those thresholds is there are also what we call soil process domains, which are the areas between thresholds. You know, at a, at a threshold, soils change a lot for a small increment in forcing. For a pedogenic threshold, pedogenic just means soil developing, soil development. For a pedogenic threshold, the uh, you get very little change in soils for a large increment in forcing. And an illustration of that from leeward Kohala, which we can see um, over looking up that way, is shown here. Um, as you move from dry to wet along this rainfall gradient, which I think is the most spectacular rainfall gradient anywhere in the world. You know, <laughs> it's, you, know you, you are familiar with the fact that in Hawaii, if you don't like the weather here, you just go to the other side of the island, right? You know, what we don't realize is just how extraordinary a thing that is, how valuable a thing that is. If you want to understand how climate controls the properties of soils, and with climate change, with humans changing the climate, that's something we all need to understand. Um, you can make use of the environmental gradients in Hawaii to understand that process in a way that would be very difficult anywhere else. If you go from dry to wet in Kohala, you find that uh, the breakdown of rock increases as a function of increasing rainfall, but up, that's only up to a point. At that, at some point, everything that can be broken down in the soil has been broken down. And after that point, there's nothing left that can break down with more rainfall. And so the amount of input of material from the breakdown of rock drops off to very low levels. And if you look at the properties of soils, they change very sharply at about the same point. You know, the properties of soils are relatively rich. This is a measure of the amount of um, calcium, magnesium, and potassium that's held on the, in the soils, which is a good measure of soil fertility. They're really fertile soils when they're dry, but then they go through a very sharp transition after which they're very infertile for a long stretch of increasing rainfall. And so our first, when we first started working in the rain-fed field systems of Kohala, part of our interest was, okay, it makes sense that uh, Hawaiians would have experienced that and understood it. And that they would have intensified agriculture in places that had enough rain for their crops to grow, but not so much rain that their soils were infertile. And in fact, that's what we found. If you... Okay, this is a more general um, slide of ideas, which just says, you know, if we think about agriculture in Hawaii and elsewhere in Polynesia, it's important, it's valuable to study because agriculture, or more generally obtaining food, is the place where people connect most strongly to features of the land. Um, many Polynesian societies developed intensive agriculture and high population densities and socially and culturally complex societies on islands. The Hawaiians in particular were great farmers, intensifying agriculture 
by many different pathways in the many different lands, lands they found within this Hawaiian archipelago. I know you've heard from Noah Lincoln and Natalie Kurashima in previous talks in this uh, series, and they've both been involved in understanding some of the variations in Hawaiian agriculture and how important they are. And, um, you know, I, my own sense is that we now appreciate the greatness of Hawaiians as navigators. The Polynesian people were the greatest navigators of their era um, when they were in their great age of discovery, moving across the Pacific and colonizing isolated island groups. But they were also the greatest farmers in the world. They intensified agriculture by multiple pathways in places that most continental people never intensified agriculture. We're just practicing shifting cultivation, slash and burn style agriculture. But the Hawaiians and many other people in Polynesia were, um, in fact, permanently establishing cultivation and maintaining that cultivation um, at a time when most continental people weren't doing anything like that at all. The most substantial contrast in Hawaii was between the irrigated wetland, Loikalo, versus the rain-fed malas, which were based on sweet potato, and the mode of agricultural production shaped the nature of society in Hawaii as it does everywhere in the world. You know, the, if you had rain-fed loikalo, as I'll talk about, you had a different society than if you had dryland, rain-fed dryland agriculture, like we see in uh, Kohala, Kona, and Ka'u on this island. And that distinction is really important in the functioning of Hawaiian society. Now, I will talk more clearly about that later in this talk. So this shows the distribution. Um, I thought this was a real map at one time. It was actually <laughs> done uh, on the back of an envelope, of a back of a napkin, cocktail napkin in an American Anthropological Society meeting. Um, but it shows the rain-fed field systems in orange of Kohala, Kona, and Ka'u, and shows a big one in Hamakua. Uh, also shows such systems on Maui, and at Kalapapa on Molokai. Kalapapa is a young volcano that's pasted against the side of Molokai. And so it, it is uh, part of the same process that uh, allows the development of rain-fed field systems. The blue here shows Loikalo. And so this map, which, as I said, was actually done on the back of a cocktail napkin, doesn't have any real basis, except it was by, done by someone who, with a lot of insight into the distribution of these agricultural systems. And so probably, as I'll show later, it captures many of the important features of the distinction among different parts of the archipelago. In particular, the island of Hawaii was dependent almost entirely on these rain-fed dryland agricultural systems. The island of Kauai was dependent almost entirely on loikalo as its source of main source of staple foods. And that difference is maintained through deeper understanding of the uh, rain-fed field systems and the loikalo and probably contributes to the difference in Hawaiian society between that of Kauai and that of this island. It also means, of course, that when young people in Hawaii go to work in Loikalo to get a connection with their ancestor source of food, they aren't actually getting a connection with their ancestor source of food. They, they should come to Punui and work in the rain-fed dryland systems, which are the place where their ancestors derive most of their food. Okay, so I'm going to focus on Kohala 
in this talk, and you can see um, this flank of Kohala volcano looking out there, and the, also the south flank, which is hidden behind the volcano here. Um, Kohala is really interesting because it, it's the one of two moku, large land divisions in the archipelago that uh, contains both rain-fed dryland systems and irrigated kalo. Hana is the other, which was uh, allied with and off, off, often close to Kohala in its uh, functioning. So the Loi Kalo are abundant in Waipio Valley. Um, these systems maintain some social and cultural continuity with the past. And they, you know, you, if you want to understand how they work, you can often ask the farmers. You know, they've changed over time but they do have some continuity with past practices. In contrast, um, if you look at the leeward side of Kohala Volcano, you see this uh, network of field walls running across the land and Malcolm Mackay trails connecting the uplands to the sea. This is Pu Kahana, which is the farthest to the left Pu up there. And you can see that the field system is uh, really well developed in that area. This is a LIDAR image, which is a like a radar altimeter, uh, laser altimeter of, the, of a portion of the previous image. You can see that the um, field system is extremely well developed. And now the trails that run from Mauka to Makai across the land are also emerging very clearly to your eye. And so these systems, um, I think, disappeared largely in the, in the 1850 through 1880 period as people moved away from the land. The Loi Kahlo um, survived the devastation of introduced disease and the destruction of colonization and maintain some continuity to the present. But these dryland systems did not. They were lost largely to um, introduced disease and to depredations of introduced ungulates um, by late in the, 90, in the 1800s. And so they're only known to us from their archaeological remnants now. And they're largely lost to memory and practice. Uh, as Kehau can tell you, we've taken many kids from Kohala and the area, including the area re immediately around Puanui, out in the field. And they had no idea that this agricultural system was even there. And it was the main agricultural system of their ancestors. It's a huge area. This is about, uh, this particular system is about 26 square miles um, stretching from below Kahoa Ranch all the way up to Opolu Point, about two miles wide and about a little over 12 miles long. And it was, there were bigger systems in Kau and Kona that uh, were probably more important to the development of Hawaiian society. There was a smaller system in the Waimea area also. So we ran a lot of transects across this agricultural system. The field system is shown in this shading here. The two different colors in the background are the two different volcanic formations of Kohala Volcano, the younger Havi formation and the older Polalu formation. And you can see that we ran transects across these, um, across the field system in multiple places and down to the sea on the 
windward side of Kohala as well. And tried to understand how soils varied along that sequence. Here, this shows the white dots are Kohala areas that are outside the agricultural system. The yellow dots are um, areas that were inside the agricultural system in, in Kohala. And you can see that there's a strong threshold where the field system ended, even though there was plenty of water in areas wetter than that. Um, if you look at the island of Kauai, which is the red dots here, you can see that there is no place that is, has both enough water to, for, to grow crops and fertile enough soils to grow crops. That sweet spot, which we identify in the Kohala area, shown here, where there's enough rain for um, crops to grow, but not so much rain that the soils have become infertile, d dwindles and disappears in older islands in the archipelago. And on Kauai and Molokai, where we've looked for it, it's gone. It's not there at all. But uh, Kohala, it's there. And Kona, which is a younger area of Mauna Loa, it's there. And then Kau, which is also a younger area of Mauna Loa, it's there. And in relatively young areas of Haleakala on Maui, it's there also. Kalapapa on Molokai, which is a young volcano, it's there. But most of Molokai, no, it's not there. Because the island is too old for there to be um, fertile enough soils for intensive agriculture in those areas. Now, it's not in some ways surprising that Hawaiians found and intensified agriculture in these areas, but it was really an extraordinary thing they did because they don't, didn't have ways of measuring soil nutrients. They had to operate operationally. Where cultivation worked, you kept it going. Where cultivation didn't work, you abandoned it after a while. And so you settled eventually on the areas that were suitable for intensive cultivation. And I think they did that in a sustained and ongoing way in the time that people were in this, in this land. So this is a map showing the distribution of the rain-fed agricultural systems here in red and the loi kalo in blue that's based on our understanding of where you could develop loi kalo and where the environment permitted you to develop rain-fed agriculture, where there was enough rain but the, and the soil was not so much rain that the soil was infertile, was where the red areas would be. And you can see that there are some strange features in this um, figure, like there's a, a right angle bend in near South Point in the Kau field system, where there's basically a straight line going up slope here, and then a right angle bend. And we looked at the uh, Google Earth images of that area, and that feature is there. Surprisingly, it's, it's there. And you can see that there's a right angle boundary to the agricultural system in Kau, in the South Point area. This uh, rain-fed field system in Kohala shows up very well. The rain-fed field system in Kona is divided by young flows that cut across it and take areas of potential cultivation out of practice, out of possibility. But it's still, there's more land in this Kona field system and in the Kau field system than there is in the Kohala field system. We think there should be another field system in the Kukai 
Haile area um, in Hamakua, but there was sugar there. And where sugar has been uh, developed, you can't see the archaeological remnants of the field system. You can see them under pasture, but you can't see them under sugar because people got had heavy equipment in developing the sugar. And so the, the field walls have been destroyed in those areas. They're not destroyed in where there are pastures, which is true for much of Kona and certainly for Kohala and some of Ka'u. Um, for Waimea and for especially Kukui Haile area, I think that uh, if there was a field system there, we've lost the trace of it. We can't see it anymore. Okay, I want to talk about a little bit about what the difference between the rain-fed system and the Loikalo was and meant to people who were occupying that land. The island of Hawaii, which is of course the youngest island in the Hawaiian archipelago, had 580 or so kilometers squared of intensive agricultural land, only 3% of which was irrigated. Kauai had 58, a tenth as much uh, intensive agricultural land, but all of it was irrigated. Because the Loi Kalo are more productive and more reliable than the rain-fed dryland systems, you know, because you can grow Kalo as a dryland crop if your rains fail. If your rains fail in the uh, dryland sweet potato systems, you lose everything. Um, because of that difference in productivity and in, in yields, um, even though Kauai had only a tenth as much um, land under intensive cultivation, it had more than a quarter as much yield from that land. And so the labor required to maintain that agricultural system was really different between um, the Big Island and Kauai, where on Kauai, um, it takes less labor to run a loi kalo because the, um, once you've built the uh, irrigation diversions, the Hawaii, that maintain the system and built the system of loi, living's pretty easy in, in the uh, loi kalo in contrast to the rain-fed drylands, where you have to be out there weeding and it takes about twice as much labor to um, maintain a single acre of land in the rain-fed drylands as it does in Loikalo. So we figured that there's a requirement of about 165,000 person years to maintain the agricultural land of the Big Island, only 8,400 um, person years of work required on Kauai. This is interesting because it squares with some of the work in Kamakau who talked about how um, men and women both worked in the uh, fields of the island of Hawaii. Men alone worked in the loi kalo of Kauai. And it makes sense that given their labor requirements, there would have been, you would have had to have both genders involved in agricultural production on this island, but not on Kauai. It also speaks to the population of Hawaii before European contact. If there were 165,000 people engaged, person years engaged in producing food from the rain-fed drylands on this island, there must have been well over 200,000 people on this island. More than are live here now on this island. And of course, they were fed entirely then by local sources of food, with no food imports at all, and no uh, none of the labor requirement met by domestic, the work of domestic animals. And so um, that distinction is probably really important that there were more people on this island in the time before European contact than there are now living on this island. 
Um, that I think that's true of every island in the archipelago, with the exception of Oahu. Well, you could, I don't think you could, you know, Hawaiians didn't, weren't urban people, they didn't have cities. And I don't know that you could support the population of Oahu from the resources of Oahu alone. But you could certainly support the population of this island from resources of this island alone. We know that because it was done in the past. Yeah? I'm curious, how, how, do we, how is the yield determined? This is from uh, areas in elsewhere in the Pacific where the traditional system is still in use. And so we know what people are getting from Loikalo now in this island, on this island. And you can, it's not very different from elsewhere, what it is elsewhere in the Pacific. We know what we're getting from uh, Uala sweet potato in the Kohala field system. And it's not very different from what people are getting in Uala-based systems in the southwestern Pacific. Yeah. So the yield per person seems a lot better on Kauai than on yeah. is the, Does that affect health or does it affect the I think it not the population size? Or what? I think it affected the uh, roles that were available to people in society more than anything else. You know, you could, there are many more people on the island of Kauai who could play roles like fisherman, farmer, priest, artist, or warrior. And you could have an army on Kauai, a standing army on Kauai, which you couldn't have on this island. Um, because everyone, or most people, were either producing food or, you know, seasonally producing food on this island. And uh, then they might play other roles during parts of the year when they weren't producing food, but they didn't have the ability. Yeah. So how does that correlate to Kamehameha's army? Oh, well, Kamehameha's army. We know from uh, the book from Ke from Keku Haupio that uh, when Kamehameha set himself against uh, his uncle, he. Uh, Keiku Haupio said, we go back to Kohala, we grow food. With that food, we feed an army. Right. With that army, we uh, conquer conquer the uh, uh, land. And A lot of the farmland was to yeah. feed the army. And yeah. That was part of the, that was part the population of, of the big army at the time. Yeah. yeah. And I think that... that uh, <laughs> One of the things that marks the greatness of Kamehameha is that he understood that logistic point in a way that uh, contemporaries mostly did not. That you had to have lots of food if you were going to uh, embark on a war of conquest. And we also know that when he conquered Oahu, he um, could see that places like Ualaka'a, Round Top on Oahu, were suitable for rain-fed dryland field systems. Um, and he developed those systems, had his army work on developing those systems on Oahu. So they didn't take food away from the Makai Nana, the people of the land. And rather, the army itself was feeding itself on the new land that they were occupying using the intensive methods of agricultural cultivation that they knew from the Big Island, but that, that weren't practiced on Oahu at that time. Yeah? I, maybe I missed how the field systems were created, the lines, if there's a walking trails, or were they low-lying rock walls? Um, the field, the trails are were paved with beach rocks, which were carried in. And they often have walls on both sides of them. So if you go up there, you can see um, cases of flat, with flat-lying rocks and then walls on both sides of them. And so the field walls themselves were um, mostly earth with some rocks in them, in the Mauka end of the field system, mostly rock walls in the Makai end of the field system. 
Yeah. So I'm a little confused because uh, Noah Lincoln, who was here a while ago, was talking about agroforestry and the role that the uh, food forests play yeah. in producing food. And, and he was saying that the, the yield from those trees, which is not very labor intensive, produced a lot of food. It produced a lot of food, but it produced it in two pulses during the year. So if you didn't have a way of storing food for the times when Ulu wasn't producing, you were in trouble. And um, we know that the systems of island archipelagos that were dependent on Ulu, like the Marquesas, the islands of Hiva, were um, places where people fermented Ulu and uh, then ate the fermented Ulu over time, which sounds awful to me, frankly. <laughs> I've never had fermented ulu, so I can't tell you. <laughs> but I think without food storage, you can't, you can't really make it on ulu. Yeah. What is it uh, you thought that the population was before European contact on the big island? Um, there are wild estimates that are all over the place, but I think the best estimate is from Lieutenant King, who was on one of Cook's ships, and uh, he estimated there were about 250,000 people on this island, and I think he was probably low, because he, his survey was a coastal survey, and we know that people were living inland on this island to a greater extent than they were on other parts of the archipelago. In the Waimea system, he missed completely. And as there was, as I understand there was a uh, attempted at conquest of North Hawaii by Maui at one time, where they sent spies over first who said, it's going to be easy. There are no people on that land. And they landed at Kauai Hai and marched inland and found that it was a really populated land, and uh, they were surrounded on Hoka'ula, and figured they were they, they they'd lost everything. But then they saw dust coming across the uh, Waimea Plain, and it was an army from Kona coming to help defeat them, <laughs> which was at that point probably entirely unnecessary. <laughs> yeah. Did the volcanic eruptions refresh the, the nutrients in the soil at all? They do, yeah. And so I think that uh, a lot of the Polulu volcanics, the old part of uh, Kohala volcano, has a deposition of Javi volcanics from the cinder cones on top of it, um, which uh, enrich those soils and uh, made them more fertile than they would be otherwise at the age they are. Yeah? What is the oldest settlement on this island and where was that? I don't know where the oldest settlement was, but I, I suspect it was probably in Waipio Valley because, you know, people would have arrived in the canoes and said, we know how to do Loi Kalo. Our ancestors did Loi Kalo in our homeland. And Waipio is a great land for Loi Kalo. So they would have settled there first and developed their Loi there. And only as they um, were forced to move out of Waipio and the other valleys there would they have um, colonized the lands in leeward Kohala and gone inland and, and probably developed slash and burn agricultural systems, which we know Polynesian farmers did, but then found they could intensify agricultural production on those lands. And so the settlements that they developed were probably younger than the settlements in Waipio Valley. And do you know how old the when was it settled? That's a, that's a really controversial area again. Yeah. Uh, when Hawaii was settled. But I think that the preponderance of evidence from dates of uh, that are done carefully are somewhere between 800 and 1100 years ago, Hawaii was settled, which is fairly typical of Eastern and Southern Polynesia. Um, much of the colonization took place in a wave in a very short time between 800 and 1100 years ago. Much of the colonization of central Polynesia took place in a wave between about 3,000 and 2,500 years ago.
and then there was a gap and then people started moving again something like 1100 years ago but it's you know you can get it you can get in great arguments about when that was <laughs> which I don't which I'd like to avoid yes <laughs> really amazing thank you so much I'm curious what can we learn from this historical um, study to help us develop a strategy for living more sustainably now I'll, I'll get to that in just a second <laughs> I think it's, I think that's an important question. I said most of this information. I think uh, we can look at the sources of nutrients that supported cultivation. Hawaiian farmers brought cultivation of crops to the rocks the rain-fed dryland farmers to where the rocks were breaking down and supplying nutrients in rain-fed agriculture. In contrast, in the Loikalo, flowing water brought the nutrients from the breakdown of rock to the agricultural crops. And so if you look at Loikalo now, they are mostly in places where water falls and the uplands moves down through unweathered rock and carries nutrients from that rock to the Loikalo. Uh, this is about Ulu, Noah Lincoln's um, work. Tree crops could draw nutrients from deep in the soil and accumulate nutrients from dilute sources in a way that annual crops can't do. Erosion also rejuvenates the supply of nutrients on valley sides in old high rainfall sites. You can concentrate nutrients in space by mulching, taking organic material from elsewhere and piling it in an area and practicing your agriculture there or time through shifting cultivation, through slash and burn agriculture, accumulating nutrients for a fallow period of often 20 or 30 years, and then cutting that forest, burning it, and drawing on the nutrients for productivity in a short time interval. This is Halaba Valley on Molokai where we do see the sides of the valley have uh, nutrient enrichment. I'm going to skip Rapa Nui here and just say, and answer the last question about uh, what we can learn from this. Um, there were, Hawaii was famous for its agricultural in innovations. There were ancestral practices like loi kalo, like shifting cultivation, and like diverse home gardens where people um, planted their crops and drew on them for their own sustenance. Also in Hawaii, people developed um, rain-fed field systems, which are entirely a Hawaiian invention. They don't exist elsewhere in the Polynesian archipelagos. They're um, something that were invented in Hawaii, innovated in Hawaii by Hawaiian farmers. And so um, they're something uniquely Hawaiian. In the same way reef flat fish ponds are, the aquacultural systems uh, on, they were developed on reef flats like this fish pond in Heia on Oahu um, were uniquely Hawaiian. They didn't exist elsewhere in Polynesia. And uh, so they were, they were innovated and developed here. There's some evidence that there was at the time of, around the time of European contact, Hawaiian society had embarked on yet a new, another innovation, which was tunneling water out of inside stream valleys and spreading that water over the land and intensifying production from the water and the nutrients contained in that water in the land. If, you, if, you've, if I don't know if any of you have seen Waiopuka, 
which is the valley just before Polalu and Kohala. There you can see a place where people had uh, tunneled into, the, into a deeply incised stream and diverted water out of it. Then we're irrigating the uplands. Now there are people who argue that that innovation was sparked by European contact, because it was around the time of European contact. But I've looked at that land, and it was clearly done with oo, and not shovels. If you had shovels, you'd use shovels. But it was done with oo, and so I think it was a Hawaiian innovation that was just occurring right at about at the time of European contact. And um, probably would have multiplied the carrying capacity of the land for its human population. Again, which the rain-fed field systems already had done, and the reef-flat fish ponds had already done. So we can, I think, ask, what can we learn from Polynesian agricultural systems that can contribute to the intensification and sustainability of our own agriculture. Now, I see at least three pathways to that were followed by different Polynesian island societies. One was when people faced the fact that their activities were degrading the productive basis of the land. They redesigned their production system and kept that new system intact for centuries. And an inherent part of that was that they regulated their population. So that was done on the island of Tikopia, a Western Polynesian outlier near the Solomon Islands, where they their production systems are look like complex rainforests, but are actually all made up of useful crops. And if you look at the, if you core into the lagoon of that island, or look at uh, human deposits on the island, you see that uh, the reef was degraded by erosion from the land at the time that system was developed. And fish had largely disappeared from the human diet. Um, but they, in their redesign of the production system, they... Um, the reef is regenerated, seafood comes back into the diet and becomes an important part of the human diet in that area, and the population is regulated explicitly. The, pollen, the chant of the Tikopia is, uh, contains the statement that every man and woman should have a son and a daughter in his or her lifetime. Otherwise, where's the food that will support them? You know. So there was that system. There were places where people persisted in earlier practices and retrogressed from a peak population or level of social development. That was probably true in Mangaya and probably also in Rapa Nui or Easter Island. I've been impressed going to Easter Island by how small and infertile that island is compared to the Hawaiian Islands compared to, especially to the island of Hawaii. And so you can see that um, there are areas that people maintained and continue to intensify cultivation up through European contact and into the time when the island population was enslaved and transported to mainland Peru to work in the mines. But there were also areas that uh, cultivation was abandoned before European contact occurred. And those areas are either the drier areas or the least fertile areas, the least fertile soils. In those areas, I think the loss of those lands from production probably decreased the food available to the society as a whole. And so forced what I would call a retrogression from a peak population or level of social development, not a collapse of the society, because the society clearly never collapsed until Europeans came and stole the people away to Peru. That was the collapse. Um, 
A third pathway that I think is, I've been increasingly impressed with is within a complex national society, um, people can, can, continue, can, can continue to innovate new production systems and innovate their way around population crunches. And so find ways to persist, even though the productive capacity of the land is um, in some sense fixed. You can say that there's no um, good end on that path, but when you say that, you that eventually you'll run into a demographic problem that you won't be able to innovate your way around. But you have to recognize that's our path. That's the path of our society too. We're, we're following the path of innovating our way out of difficulty. And so far we've succeeded in doing that. Hawaiian society followed that path, I think, um, and continued to innovate uh, because they were a populous, complex, and highly structured society. They were able to um, innovate new production paths that uh, weren't accessible to people on other islands where the size of the island or the organization society wouldn't support public works by, wouldn't support the mobilization of labor by chiefs to achieve social goals. But they were possible in Hawaii. And that innovation of new pathways of agricultural production, I think is a more dynamic form of sustainability that uh, we could probably learn from, get something from. Um, I am impressed that people on islands generally are have some advantages when it comes to making a transition to sustainability in comparison to people on continents. They um, can see that all the resources that are left are all the resources that it will ever be. Their islands are their world. And so if they um, are using up their resources, their resources are going to be gone. I think we've all become islanders in our lifetimes. Um, we can see now that Earth is an island floating in the hostile environment of space. And that uh, island is all we have. And we can see that our activities are looming large on a global scale. This is the curve of carbon dioxide accumulation in the atmosphere from Mauna Loa from the observatory on Mauna Loa. And it shows that uh, even our waste products are looming large on a global scale, are affecting the Earth as a whole. And so the question is, can we learn from this, uh, from the fact that we're an island now, and we can see that we're an island, and we can see that our waste products are looming large on the global scale, what islanders were forced to learn in the past when they could see that what was left was all there was or ever would be, and that they were degrading the productive capacity of their lands. And I don't know if we'll succeed in that or not, but I think that there is a path that other people have followed ahead of us that show us that it's possible to develop more sustainable systems. Yeah. Okay. Question? Yes. The Ahupua'a yeah. pie-shaped land division that I read about, where the Makai and the, Ma and the Malka would share the resources from right. the sea and from the mountains. It's probably not that much going on in the mountains, from what you said, that that, that pie shape probably was oversimplified. I think it was oversimplified in that uh, I think if we look at places like Kohala with its rain-fed dryland systems, the um, the Ahupua exist there and tend to run uh, perpendicular to the land from the sea to the mountain, but they don't, uh, they aren't watersheds. 
that uh, is sort of the conventionalism of what an ahupua is. They uh, functioned entirely differently. I think they were still they still functioned in agricultural production, in that uh, people probably moved seasonally um, and intensified agriculture from in the. Uh, Winter, you get the Kona storms that come in and wet the lowlands, and so it's both warm and wet in the lowlands. In the summer, you don't have those Kona storms, but you have the trade winds blowing over and wetting the uplands. And so it's warm and wet again in, in that environment. And people probably intensified production there and moved up and down slope, depending on where there were warm and wet conditions for their agriculture. Okay. Um, Kehau and Hello Hameli. Yeah. We'll be happy to answer any questions about. <laughs> <laughs> we can assist. Yeah. Next, can we hear about the noise? Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. Um, uh, let me just start with how many of you have been there? Stop it. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, these are some great volunteers and Ohana over here that have been there. Of course, Peter and... Um, um, it's easier for us to explain what we do if you go there. I'll just say that. We are Aina based. We engage people in um, our experiments and like Peter, um, it's, we are very fortunate to work with great scientists, by the way. Um, we learn from them and they learn from us. Uh, we engage, both of us, um, Mele and I as well as um, Peter, we engage in experiments to better understand what was going on on the Aina and to also engage in experiments that help us uh, come up with best practices, if you will, for this time that we live in, in these conditions that we are enduring. Um, so everyone is welcome to come. <laughs> so how, how do we do that? Um, go to our website, it's probably the easiest way, and um, our phone numbers are up there. You can contact us directly or just send an email through the website. Um, and we're really not great with email, <laughs> but I say we've been working really hard on doing like a 48-hour turnaround. So if we see something, we're like, we've got 48 hours, we got to get to this. Um, so we're working on that. Um, yeah, any other questions though? Okay. Um, Are you going to talk about Puwanui? We can. What do you want to know? I can talk forever. <laughs> and, and then now there's two of us, and that's even double. <laughs> but if you just um, throw out some questions, maybe that will help. But um, we can um, help you understand what the place is like, perhaps, or what you what might is experience. It? Can I start with what is it? Sure. Um, the Ahupua'a of Puwanui is one of 33 Ahupua'a that make up the um, Kohala dryland field system. Peter had already explained that the Ahupua'a isn't that um, pie shape like we too have learned in our books. Um, and so that reminds us in our culture how everything is very place specific. So we like to say anything we engage you in up there, that's A way to do something, it's not Z way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So to be real mechanistic here, Mile marker what goes through you? Guys. Love that. <laughs> so when you're on the Kohala Mountain Road and you hit the 14 mile marker, uh, we are on the Makai side, so the left side of the road. And uh, if you hit the 15 mile marker, you've passed us. Okay, cool. <laughs> when we say we're in the field system, we're definitely out on the Aina in the field system. There's no infrastructure um, where we're at. And like Auntie Kahal mentioned, all ages are welcome. And a huge part of the work that we do on the ground is just to share what we know about the place and the history and significance of the Aina of Puanui itself. And we say this all the time, the true experience and the true host is the Aina itself. And so if you get the chance, come come out and visit us and you'll you'll get a different um, a different feeling for all of the Ike that Uncle Peter has shared here with us tonight. Um, a, a lot of what he shared is a really great reminder for me every time we hear him talk, even out on the Aina, um, it's a treat for us because we're continually learning as well. Um, but it's a really, really great reminder for me about the brilliance and the attunement of our kupuna and our ancestors. If you think about all the advancements of technology and the science that we have today and what 
the scientists like Dr. Batusik has gone through um, to have all of this to share with everybody. Take a moment and think about our ancestors hundreds and hundreds of years ago who were able to tap into the potential of the Aina through their innate connection and that reciprocal relationship with the land. And so I think in experiencing a day, um, several hours at Puanui, we get a glimpse of what that was and the opportunity that we have to connect to space and to land today. Yeah. Any other questions? Do you folks do like work days or? Um, not at this time. We tried that and we're we're working all the time. So, <laughs> so it's better if you contact us and if you want to coordinate a small uh, group of friends or if you have family visiting uh, or anything like that. We're open to everything. So that works better um, to touch base with us and we plug you in on a day that might work for both of us. <laughs> One more back there. Yeah. Uh, wasn't there a period when there was a lot of forests on the leeward side? Um, didn't uh, that affect the, uh, the agricultural opportunity? Peter, you want to respond to that about the forest? You're going to get the layman's term if I answer that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there was forest that came down to the upper edge of the field system. The field system was probably not forested itself. And it probably did have an effect on the amount of water in the soil. Because, not because, in Kona you know that water evaporated from that, uh, from the land comes back to the land as the, that upslope downslope cycle goes on. In Kohala, I think the water passes once, the wind passes once over the land and then blows out to sea. And so the interception of clouds by the trees is the only thing that really matters, not the amount of rain. There's probably not more rain in those days than there is now, but there was more water captured by the trees and added to the soil in those days. Did, did, all, did some of the, did you do rock building or earth building? Did that capture also the water? <laughs> We think so. We, we think that uh, the, the field walls probably had uh, co-sugarcane growing on them. And we know that Hawaiians would use that sugarcane for mulch and would remove uh, leaves from sugarcane as soon as they started to turn yellow at all. So they had spindly sugarcane there that waved a lot in the breeze and would capture mist blowing by the um, by themselves and then drop it on the soil as they waved in the breeze. And I think that was probably an important source of water to the agricultural system. Yes, what kind of livestock might have been around at that time? None. <laughs> <laughs> Pigs. Yeah. Well, um, and I think that sugar cane leaves would feed the pigs too. So. Um, yeah, so we've recently learned that the, um, the poor hour, the pigs in the area um, helped add to the wealth of the landowners in Kohala, moving into um, post-contact time too. Um, we learned too that it was the wahine or the women that domesticated those pigs and brought them into the field system to um, cultivate or till, if you will, the aina. Mm -hmm. And um, we've done experiments with that. Um, also, and that does make a difference in the aina as far as the time that we have to wait before we put another crop in. So, yeah. Steve, early on, you mentioned that um, the mica and dust gets blown in uh, from Central Asia. I was just wondering, um, that I might just be completely wrong, but I uh, was under the impression that the um, dominant winds go the wrong way for that, blowing towards Asia. So how does the, um, the, how does the dust get here? The high altitude winds are coming from, are blowing from east to west. So if dust gets up into the upper atmosphere, it keeps coming. You can see the shadow of dust in the in ocean cores coming off of Asia. Thank you. Any more questions? 
um, eat. Oh, and you. Sarah, did you want to add to your experience at Puanui at all? Yep, I'm just going to put you on the spot. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. 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 Oh. <laughs> oh, it's it's been a, a wonderful experience because it's not only getting your hands into the into the aina, you learn so much about the history and and you're so knowledgeable about that and um, I don't know it's just a all around fabulous experience. And I'll say that. Um, Pete and Sarah have been at Pornui on several occasions when it was really uh, windy, <laughs> windy and rainy, really like no wind and just hot. <laughs> um, and those are the things that you'll experience when you're on the Aina is, um, again, like Mele mentioned, the Aina is the kumu or the source. We are the human hosts and the elements. Um, yeah, they, uh, they appear. <laughs> okay, no more questions? Oh, okay. Thank you. Mahalo. Yeah. Oh. Okay.